Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Welcome to our webinar. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you're joining us today for the first time, hopefully you have watched our previous two webinars, or if you're coming back uh, to our third webinar, welcome back. We will spend just a few minutes on housekeeping and reviewing previous materials. As you may know, this, webinar's, this webinar is co-sponsored by two organizations, IFC and the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance. My name is Rusmir Music, and I'm the Operations Officer at IFC, the International Finance Corporation. I will be serving as your Master of Ceremonies today, and I will call on our wonderful speakers to contribute their interventions. As you know, this is a final in the series of webinars taking you through tools and investment programs that can unlock finance for green and resilient hotels. Each of the webinars so far has been recorded and presentations and recording are being shared on the landing site. During the webinar, you can ask your questions via the chat feature in the WebEx application, and we will be sure to answer them either during or after the presentation. In previous webinars, you have heard about tools and programs such as the Pathway to Net Positive Hospitality, which was launched by the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance. And the pathway breaks the journey for each hotel into manageable steps to measure and to minimize impact. We also talked about IFC's integrated program, GRIP, and this stands for Greening Real Estate Investment Portfolios. GRIP is a one-stop shop to help assets, asset owners define, implement, and finance their green transition. We also did a deep dive into EDGE, an innovation of IFC, which stands for Excellence in Design for Greater Efficiencies. This initiative consists of three components. First, the free software helps you choose the most uh, cost-effective ways to build green. Second, EDGE is an achievable green building standard, which starts with a 20% resource efficiency criteria and puts the buildings on the path toward net zero achievement. And third, EDGE is a certification system to verify and reward green building projects through a green label. A reminder that the information and the presentations on the previous webinars is already posted on our website, and this can be accessed and viewed. In this session, we will explore the topic of risk and how hotels can respond to climate risks and build their resilience. We will talk about why looking into climate resilience is very important for hotels. And then we will look at tools that hotels can already utilize today. And this will address both disaster effects of climate change, like storms or sea level rise, and long-term effects such as water shortages. Let me start with our first speaker. I'm pleased to introduce or reintroduce to you Claire Whiteley, Head of Environment at the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance. As a quick recap of the previous webinar, Claire, can you remind us what the Alliance does? Of course, thanks Rosemary for that. Um, yes, yeah, so the Alliance is basically an organization that brings together um, hotel companies from around the world across various different types um, of, of hotel company. And we're really there to use our collective power across the value chain to deliver impact locally and on a global scale. And we also work with various partners um, across the value chain, including suppliers of the industry, um and owners investors people like that we have about seven million rooms that are covered within our network at the moment um and that's ever growing wonderful claire let's talk about why water is such an important part of the hotel industry and how you are addressing it of course thanks for me um so let's start with why water risks are pertinent to the hospitality industry Water is a fundamental resource which underpins life on Earth, but water risk is a global issue that's already affecting more than 2 billion people. And this is projected to increase by 2030 with demand for water expected to exceed supply by about 40%. Water risks also pose a critical threat to business viability across the globe. And the hospitality industry is no exception to this, as water is not only essential for food preparation and personal hygiene, but it also underpins many of the processes which are core to the running of a hotel, such as housekeeping and heating and cooling systems. 
and the impacts of water scarcity can have huge financial implications. For example, the crisis in Cape Town led to an estimated $65 million shortfall in the region's income from hospitality. So managing water scarcity and ensuring responsible consumption has therefore been quite a long um, term piece that's been integral to the industry. Very interesting, and I very much remember the Cape Town uh, situation. So tell us what's available to help the industry understand and respond to these risks. Mm. Well, to help the industry become more resilient through understanding the different water related risks, which are faced in different locations and using that knowledge to make more informed decisions when selecting locations for and designing new hotels. The Alliance have partnered with Ecolab, Greenview and STR to develop the Destination Water Risk Index. And this maps areas of high water stress with areas of high hotel growth. And in doing so, it enables companies and investors to explore, assess and financially value and respond to water risks specific to the hotel industry in both in their current and in planned operations. Destination water risk covers 379 destinations across 63 countries and the risks included in the index can be broken down into three categories. We have financial risks such as water stress and seasonal variability, financial risks which include the potential for increased costs, revenue at risk and current water benchmarks for the destination, and then market risks which include estimated future growth of the industry in the destination and how much the destination currently relies on tourism for its GDP. And data has been pulled from sources including the World Resource but um, Institute's Aqueduct Water Risk Atlas, Ecolab's Water Risk Monetizer, and the Cornell Hotel Sustainability Benchmarking Index, among a few other, other sources as well. And tell us, Claire, what has the index highlighted um, so far? Well, through the analysis, we identified four locations with the highest overall risk of water stress, Delhi in India, the Maldives, and then Qingdao and Xi'an in China. And there were a further 45 destinations which were categorized as having high water risk, which highlights the need to prioritize all of these locations when designing water stewardship strategies, particularly among global portfolios. The majority of the, the high risk destinations were in Asia, the Middle East and Africa, um, and I'll show you a little bit more information on the next few slides. So most of um, the Asia Pacific destinations have moderate to high risks and overall the region really presents a significant percentage of very high level risks in both financial and market risks. Then when we come to the Middle East and Africa, this region shows a high portion of destinations with high or very high risk in both physical and market risks and severely high in financial risk. And this is likely due to the typically arid conditions with low rainfall. And based on that score, nearly all destinations in the region are high risk. So there's definitely a need to focus there. However, nearly all destinations in the Americas were seen to have very low to moderate risk with the majority classified as low or very low. And in Europe, the majority of destinations were found to have very low or low risk. However, it is worth noting that alongside the two high risk destinations, nine destinations, many of which are key tourist um, locations, present a moderate risk. And this included places like Barcelona, Brussels, Dublin, London, Madrid, Rome, Venice and Florence. Um, and we, we, we would expect to see the risks kind of increase as we go forwards in time in those locations. So tell us, how can the index be used to support uh, future resilience? Well, the key findings, including destinations with high and very high overall risks, as well as those with, with high physical risks, financial risks and market risks, are all summarised in, in the report that you can find available on our website. It's freely available. 
Um, and then the full data set can be requested so that you can dig down into individual destinations, which are of interest to you and understand the nine risks that sit behind those metrics and which ones would be most important um, for your portfolios. It can be of particular use for owners when they're determining locations for hotel development. So the hotel pipeline as a percentage of supply and the future water stress should be considered to really understand the potential risks of the planned future hotel growth. And this will be of particular importance in water stressed areas where management of demand and supply is critical. But destinations with moderate and higher risk level for these metrics have a high tendency of being impacted by future cost increases. So additional properties built in these markets may face increased local water stress in the future. And because of this, their operational costs will likely increase with potential loss of revenue due to future water shortages, national or local regulation and reputational risk changes in national or local water tariffs and the reduction in value of buildings if they're not designed to be efficient. So building design should incorporate really high efficiency water systems such as low flow showers, toilets, taps and water saving features such as automatic rigid pool cover um, and automatic sprinklers and then also looking at kind of more um, embedded systems that are really sort of recycling and reusing water and continuous monitoring of risk exposure from consumption, as well as planning for diversification in destinations within a portfolio to really minimise that risk exposure can also be considered. Um, although that doesn't address the water risk specifically, but it may help in managing the overall business risk. And then for hotel operators, regular monitoring of water consumption and an action plan for improvement is really essential, particularly in destinations with high and very high baseline water stress and incoming risk. And advanced water management best practices are recommended to manage water use efficiently and to avoid being impacted by future water related cost increases. These include things like what I've mentioned previously, but also rainwater capture, grey water reuse, native or drought tolerant landscaping, leak detection for water piping um, and toilet tanks, and also ensuring that you're, um, you've got water submetering in place to really understand and track water consumption. And this latest report um, forms part of our wider vision of net positive hospitality. Rizme, you mentioned at the beginning that pathway. Um, and we're really aiming to create a prosperous and responsible global hospitality sector, which is giving back to the destination more than it takes. So the destination water risk index joins our pathway to net positive hospitality, which we launched earlier this month. And it sits alongside all our other tools and resources, um, which are freely available on our website to support hotels to um, kind of go on that journey and to understand and, and respond to those risks. Thank you so much, Claire. And we have uh, two really good questions. So why don't we pause uh, now and, and address them? So the first question is, does the index take into consideration uh, climate change effects? So I'm assuming future. Or is it based on averages, which I'm assuming uh, this is Fatima asking you, is based on today? Mm -hmm. Or can you do both? Um, it's based on today um, at the moment, um, but we are kind of updating it um, as we go forwards. And as we've done, this is our second version of the, the index, um, and we're sort of always bringing in new risk metrices. Um, so that's definitely something that we can keep in our back pocket as a suggestion for the, for the next version. That's great. And this is another example where these different tools have some um, overlaps. So anybody, uh, if you have watched uh, last week's uh, webinar with Edge, we probably focused a little bit more on the energy side um, through resource efficiency, but Edge has a very strong uh, water component as well. Um, and with the Edge tool, you can do simulations around your hotel. So all of these different practices um, and um, the risk factors that Claire is talking about can then be also put into Edge where you can assess your own hotel and see exactly where would be the return on investment or, or, or the long term um, effects of, of putting in these practices. So this is where our different tools really align. 
We have um, one more question uh, from Sarah for you, Claire. Many companies and others use the terms water scarcity, water stress, and water risk. If we could reach a shared understanding of what these terms mean and how they relate to one another, um, especially as they apply to corporate water stewardship. So I guess this is a question to you around standard setting and what is the Alliance doing to have that kind of common understanding of, of these different terms. Mm. Um, interestingly enough, actually, um, we launched our, our new five year strategy um, earlier this week and part of the work that we're going to be doing as we go forwards um, is very much focused on standard setting. Um, and looking at measurements and things like that. Um, so I think that's something that we will we will bring into that. Um, for now, I would say to focus on people like um, the Alliance for Water Stewardship um, and WWF. There are various organisations out there that have um, some good guidance in terms of water stress, um, water risk, all these sort of um, terms that get thrown around. Um, but yeah, we will certainly look at um, I guess look, seeing whether we can come to some definitions which are industry specific and really kind of um, pull on those experts out there, but look at how are they apply in, they apply um, directly to the industry. That's great, and I think IFC can do potentially more in this particular space. We focus so much on definitions of um, resource efficiency, not so much on what does the baseline mean for for water scarcity. But there is a lot of new um, energy around an area of finance called blue finance, which addresses water. It could mean you know everything from preventing um, ocean plastics to in, in ensuring that the the asset um, under management is um, you know has good water stewardship. So there are um, sources of finance out there available, and it would be um, and so these things can actually be connected to make sure that you uh, you finance your program, uh, in which case there's some international standards on the finance side um, as well. So we'll, that's, that could be another area for us to work together. Yeah, definitely. One more quick question from, um, let's see, how is it possible to check established compliance or is this a freelance thing for the hotels? Um, so this index isn't about compliance in any way. Um, it's there to provide guidance um, and is something that can be pulled on when companies are looking at um, their, their risks and trying to understand that. Um, it's there to be used by the industry. As I mentioned, it's freely available. We can provide um, support as well if people need help to kind of understand what the what the figures mean for them. Um, but, um, yeah, it, it's not sort of a, a compliance, um, related issue. If the, um, the hotel does want to go and get certified, they can use international certification standards like edge. Um, but they would have to ensure that there is a resource efficiency on energy and water and many times on materials um, as well. So, if you're interested in the kind of the compliance route and making sure that you are being certified as a green property um, again make sure that you watch the last uh, well not last week's but last webinar um, on edge which talks about um, that particular avenue Claire, thank you so much we'll i'm sure more questions um will will come through so and, and you know feel free to uh, to uh, put them in in the chat um and we'll we'll address them along the way including with our um, next speaker so really appreciate this and we'll see you at the end for q a Thanks, Rosemary. Let me now turn over to Naz uh, Bacon, who will talk about the Building Resilience um, Index. Naz is calling us from Turkey. We have an international crowd today from Washington, D.C., United uh, London, and uh, Turkey. So, Naz, before we start today, can you remind us and the audience what is IFC's role and how does resilience tie in with our strategy? Of course. Thank you, Rosemary. So IFC is a member of the World Bank Group and we provide investments into the private sector. Though we are first and foremost an investment bank, and what differentiates IFC from other institutions is that we, are, we provide patient capital with longer tenors and we can deploy advice and innovative structuring to overcome local barriers to investment. With uh, the 2015 Paris Agreement, it became very evident that IFC and the World Bank Group at large needed to amplify the support for climate adaptation and resilience. 
So a need was identified for developing rating systems to incentivize such investments and proving, improving the tracking of these efforts. So building resilience index uh, was developed as a solution to meet this need for the buildings and cities, which is one of our key investment areas. And now, can you tell us why are buildings so important to addressing climate change? Yeah, good point. So we know that the building sector accounts for about like 40% of energy related greenhouse gas emissions globally. So making it a large contributor for to climate change. And we know that with global urbanization trends, that floor area of buildings are expected to almost double by 2060. So if we don't do the right choices today, we're going to lock in like high carbon urban infrastructures for like the next 50 years, which is going to further aggravate climate change. So on the other side of the story, buildings are getting damaged by all these disasters, which are becoming more frequent and severe due to climate change. So countries such as the Philippines, many Caribbean states are getting struck multiple times with tropical storms. And they can attest that reconstructing all these assets are becoming a recurring cost on their economies. Furthermore, this recurring reconstruction is also part of a contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, leading to this like vicious cycle that reinforces climate change. So these emissions from reconstructions, also I should mention, is not only relevant for climate disaster, but all sorts of natural disasters. Um, you mentioned that I'm from um, base in Turkey. So the recent earthquakes here caused up about like 100 billion uh, economic losses. And we need to reconstruct entire cities, which means that we're going to be emitting a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to break this vicious cycle. So every new building, every retrofit and every post disaster reconstruction should adopt both green and resilient practices. So in IFC, we've been a leading organization to support green buildings, as you mentioned, through our Edge Green Buildings program. And almost all our investments in uh, real estate have been green. And more recently, so to complement our efforts uh, there, we have begun um, to address climate adaptation and resilience in the building sector through Building Resilience Index. Thanks, Naz. And Hearing about these impacts, it's very clear that there's a general need to increase resilience and adaptation to climate change. But let's talk about how this um, affects hotels specifically. Yeah, let's first take a step back a little bit to understand how climate change is like affecting the overall client system, right? So there are two things, uh, two concepts that we should focus on. One is chronic stresses and one is acute shocks. So chronic stresses are these like long onset um, impacts, such as the increase in mean global temperatures, sea temperatures, like changes in the precipitation patterns, you know, like uh, ice sheet melting, all those. When we are looking at acute shocks, these, these short onset, abrupt, and most often very destructive disaster events. And there are some that are not like uh, destructive, but these are more like shorter term in general. And to be honest, most of these are sort of overlinked. For example, when the ocean temperatures are increasing, we get stronger tropical cyclones or when we have longer, you know, like um, periods of uh, dryness and like higher temperatures coupled with like heat waves, we have uh, wildfires which can occur more easily. So the data shows us that these acute shocks are increasing in number and their impact. And so when we look into the tourism sector, the chronic stresses uh, and acute shocks will impact the demand for the tourism destinations, season durations, operations, and physical infrastructures. And just to note that if, we, if you can move, yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, so with these impacts, and we know like all these different impacts will vary from tourism segment to tourism segment, and do, because they're exposed to different hazards. So let me elaborate, try to elaborate. For example, 
with ocean acidification on as a chronic stress or marine heat waves as an acute shock, we know that we're experiencing coral bleaching, so we're losing the reefs, coral reefs. This is a value loss for coastal and ocean uh, sea life type of tourism segments. So that they are like, if, if the corals are lost, the demand for these sectors might lose um, demand there. Or uh, if the, if the ice, ice snowfall is reduced significantly, so we have less cover, snow cover, snow or ski based um, tourism destinations will have either shorter seasons or need to change their uh, focus altogether. And from again, like from a chronic perspective, uh, we know that increased temperatures or, you know, like overall water scarcity, like lack of uh, precipitation may pose an operations risk, as we just mentioned uh, by Claire. And on the other hand, like the other extreme with the key shocks is like the heat waves, the droughts, and these are very important for how, you know, all sorts of tourism segments perhaps needs to think about water efficiency, water um, recycling, and um, all, all those sorts of solutions. And when we come to the more physical infrastructure type impacts, one on one hand, sea level rise is going to, for example, impact a lot of coastal properties, all these uh, nice resorts we have, and hurricanes and storm surges are going to be those like acute shocks on these types of uh, hotels as well. So, um, and it's not just the hotels, right? It's the entire ecosystem that supports the, these tourism. So it's the ports, it's the airports that are going to be affected. Um, it was like for Caribbean, um, if like, for example, sea level rise increases above one meter mark, we know that like about 50 to 60 percent of the region's resorts will be affected, including 21 airports and 35 ports. And this is going to be like tens of billions of dollars of um, costs of like managing and um, addressing these risks or damages if, if the mitigation is not uh, taken care of. So if you look at like, if you zoom in on how these acute shocks are affecting buildings that be hotels or any sort of building really, these impacts can range from a total loss of the entire asset to non-structural damages or just business disruption operations. And I mean, even the tourists not being able to get to your destination will be a disruption of your operation at this point. So either way, these will have social and economic consequences for your guests, for your employees, and for the sector in total. So the other element that we need to think about is the insurance um, and insurance protection, right? Insurance penetration has been around one third of all assets globally. So with climate change, the insurance sector is also beginning to avoid covering high risk assets. Mm -hmm. And there are reports that state that there's a risk that climate impacts could make re some resorts, hotels, and facilities totally unusable, rendering them stranded assets and bringing financial losses to investors and operators. So hospitality sector really needs to urgently take action to enhance resilience of their assets and business operations. Thanks, Naz. The picture doesn't always look good, but I guess the, the main question is, wouldn't all of this be too expensive? Am I, as a hotel owner or operator, really going to take, you know, get my return on investment if I spend my money on retrofitting my property or launching a new property that's that's ready for disasters? Or is this something that's just going to happen much later in the future and I just don't need to worry about that? Well, I mean, the data is clear there and the observations are clear. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure if we asked anyone in the Caribbean or Philippines, they, the hotel uh, sector stakeholders will tell you that they're already facing these climate disasters. So, uh, and we, we know that like through different evidence that if we invest in risk reduction measures and increase resilience before disasters occur, we actually save money, which would have been otherwise would be spent to recover from the disaster. So investing in risk reduction measures that pushes buildings even beyond a building code is estimated to save about $4 for every dollar spent. So it, there is definitely a clear business case. Great. 
Um, one of the questions came up uh, was, you know, will we provide us with the presentation materials? And absolutely we will. So we'll remind you at the end of the webinar that we are recording the full webinar. Um, the other two webinars have already been recorded and posted on the website along with the presentation materials. So no need to worry about that. We'll, uh, you'll be able to see everything. Now let's talk about standards. So in the conversation with Claire, uh, clearly, you know, one of the market needs is to, to really define terms like water scarcity. I think we talked about IFC has been a leader in defining what a green building would be. So what does IFC consider to be a resilient building and what are we doing uh, for resilience? So in the, in the context of building resilience in this, we define a resilient building as a building which can withstand all the natural and climate hazards that it's exposed to and ideally be able to continue its operations without disruption following an intense hazard event. So it's really like the physical integrity and operational continuity together. And as I see, we are implementing building resilience index program to promote mainstreaming of resilient buildings. And we do this through four axes. One of them is to improve access. We're trying to improve access to finance for resilient projects uh, by investing through financial institutions. We try to facilitate direct investment to establish resilient demonstration projects. And we improve uh, the public policy environment by promoting incentives in, for a resilient building market, working with public sector stakeholders. And of course, finally, we have as the final like component, we have the building results index app, which is a simple and straightforward assessment and declaration system for developers, banks, insurance companies to really communicate the value of resilient buildings. And so if we zoom in on the application and the, the program itself, uh, Building Resilience Index is a web-based hazard mapping and resilient assessment framework for the building sector. And there are three components of it. So the we'll, first component is we try to identify risk by facilitating access to location-specific hazard information. We try to enable managing risks by providing resilience measures to mitigate all applicable hazards. And thirdly, we try to disclose risks by improving, uh, providing a standardized system to that will enable transparency for disclosing a portfolio or a project's resilience information between sector stakeholders. So, um, if, if if you don't mind, let me elaborate each each element a little bit further. So. So, first of all, the building resilience index helps identify location specific hazards which can impact a building's physical integrity at asset level. So, and we look at 15 hazards in four main categories of wind, fire, water, geoseismic. And in each category, we have one hazard that is identified as the default. So you can see that downburst for wind, local urban flooding for uh, water, local fire for fire, and subsidence for geoseismic hazards. And each in each uh, building, all the, these four will be applicable for all buildings, and the rest of the hazards will be location dependent. And you would note that we're not only covering climate hazards, but all others. Uh, so we're trying to make sure that we provide a holistic multi-hazard approach to risk reduction in buildings. And additionally, we cover hazards that are not uh, that don't damage buildings usually, such a, uh, but that can disrupt their operations, such as heat waves and droughts, and those are sort of covered in, in, in the operational continuity segment of our measures. And to be honest, the tools like Destination Water Risk Index can help identify those kinds of operational hazards and risks uh, very, uh, that could support us. So. Um, let's let's move on to how we mitigate and the risk and do the assessment. And so, well, uh, so once we know which hazards a building is exposed to, Building Resilience Index can provide a list of risk reduction measures uh, to address all these applicable hazards, and also a list of operational continuity measures as well. So uh, this. Application can be used at design, post construction, or retrofit stages of a building's life cycle and across a wide range of buildings, including hospitality. 
So the risk reduction measures can range from where you select your site, to how you structurally engineer your building, how you integrate mechanical and electrical engineering details, all the way to third party reviews of your design or construction inspections. And the list of mitigation measures is, are designed, uh, is designed to serve a dual purpose. So on one hand, it helps you assess where your resilience is at. And on the other hand, it allows you to identify areas of improvement or like, additional solutions that you can implement uh, in, in time. And then the grade letter rating system sort of facilitates the communication of the and as you can see, the rating starts from NR, which is not resilient, goes as B, A, and AA. And each measure is associated with a rating level. And so to achieve a higher resilience rating, a building must adopt all proposed measures for that level and any below it. And by addressing operational continuity measures, the plus gets added to the ratings. So in this system, what we're trying to do is that the AA reflects global best practices. And so to reach resilience levels that go above life safety and move towards like as asset protection itself, buildings should really aspire towards the AA rating. And this, this, the way that the rating works is that it is built on the weakest link principle. So each category gets rated individually and the project's overall rating is the rating of the lowest category. And so how do we, how does this all work, right? So building resilience index is a self-assessment and verification tool. So a developer, an asset owner, a hotel operator can assess the resilience of their building with support of their in-house and design and engineering teams then the project will be ready to be verified. So to do so, each measure needs to be verified by at least two licensed engineers with at least 10 years of experience. And currently we're at the pilot phases of the program and we are planning to have global and or local verification partners that can provide these kinds of third party auditing services. Great, Naz, we'll, we'll move to um showing the app in just a minute, but there was a great question that I think is related to what you were just saying from Fatima again. Are there local experts representatives who have region specific knowledge and can be part of the design team iteration? So maybe talk about sort of the overall plans to educate the market and to bring um, these experts up to speed in how to use the, the app. Of course, so currently we do deliver trainings on demand, but we are actually building a online self-paced learning package uh, that takes you all the way to verification. And, and like the, depending on the degree of your engineering architectural education, of course. So um, please stay tuned for that. And if you um, like follow, follow resilienceindex.org for uh, updates on that, because we will definitely be launching the training programs very soon. And that's so that's, that's our goal um, to provide a global training. That's great. And again, if you're new um, to our webinars and didn't participate last time, um, we'll, we'll send the recordings. So EDGE, um, our green buildings program, which is more mature and has been around for longer, has an entire ecosystem where we train uh, what we call EDGE experts to be able to provide those services. So with the building resilience, we're doing a fairly similar rollout I think that the main difference is while construction practices are fairly similar around the world and doing, um, you know, it doesn't require a lot of local customization, the building resilience is a little bit different because it requires a lot of data that goes into um, putting that in. So now let's talk about the, the app, you know, how does it work? How do we access it? How does the process work? Um, let's go through the details. Awesome. And All right. Can, Let me I'll stop sharing and you can um, switch to yours. All right, let's and share it. Just to confirm, can you see my screen? It is coming now. All right, perfect. So if you go to resilienceindex.org, you will have access to our application. Uh, Building Resilience Index is a free uh, 
product that uh, it's a public good, so all of you can uh, go sign up and um, start using it. But before I actually show how the assessment of a project sort of flows, I'd like to take you to our explore page where we actually make our hazard layers um, publicly visible. And let me zo zo zoom in on Dominican Republic for a second here. So as you can see, we have different uh, types of layers for different hazards. And so we are able to like turn turn these on and off to see like where our different types of risks are in, uh, in, in a given country. So some of these maps are like, we are trying to work with local authorities if possible, or have like global um, institutions that have been developing these sort of maps to integrate different types of uh, hazard maps into our environment so that the application when it's seeking whether a location has certain aspects applicable or not, uh, it, it looks at, you know, like, to, for example, to assess wildfire risk, it looks at proximity to forests to begin with. So we have a forest area layer or we have you know, a global landslide risk layer so that we know whether that area is prone to landslide risks or not. So all of those are um, for, for available for you to play around. We have Philippines, uh, Caribbean countries integrated and Vietnam integrated into the um, maps uh, for the moment, but we are constantly growing and updating our uh, product. So let's let's move on into the uh, actual um, testing of uh, how we go through a project cycle. So when you, for if you sign up, you can easily log in, and so one thing that that the app can do is to show you an overview of all your projects and where how they land, so that um, you can access different types of projects, your drafts completed projects, and you can easily collaborate within your organization uh, to work collaboratively on these assessments. So let me go and start a project, um, first create a project. So we need to have a, a developer or like an organization uh, uh, that the project needs to be hosted under. So I'm kind of, for now, um, going with a readily established organization in my account, but you can easily create an organization by clicking here and um, creating an organization. So, so let's say this is a demo. Um, oh, and let's say it's. Now it's going to ask us where our hotel is. And because I showed the Dominican Republic, um, oops. let's go to Dominican Republic. Uh, let's, let's pick a spot, uh, in Santo Domingo and let's make it close to a river. So let's see how, how, how they are. Location close to a river. All right. See how that works. So then we're gonna once we select our location, uh, we're gonna be asked where in its life cycle this building is uh, to fill before we come to the assessment page. So right now it is assessing all these risks in the background, and we come to the project page. Let's say we're at design stage for this, and this is the, the $10 million hotel project. I'm just making it up for now. Five floors and five. Sorry, why did I say 2015? Okay, so we come to our project page where all information and all assessments can be done uh, through it. So on, on the main overview page, you see all the information you have entered. 
uh, and you see your project location, you see a summary of the rating, and we haven't done anything yet, so there's nothing to show, but the important thing is that you see all the hazards that will be applicable to this location. So you remember I picked a location that's close to the river and close to the coast. So we immediately see storm surges, tsunamis, river lake floods, uh, coastal floodings appear here. And we also know that Dominican Republic is an earthquake area and prone to landslides. So, and there are tropical uh, cycle uh, hurricanes that happen. And so all of those do occur on this list. And I'll come to this in a bit, but also note that we have something on the costs here. So as we go through the assessments, we have some cost data affiliated with each mitigation measure embedded for certain locations. So if you, let's say, get a B-rated building, the application will tell you what your incremental cost to reaching the next level would be in this section. Let's go on to the assessment and see how it sort of like plays out, right? So we have each of the measures listed in each of the categories here. And in each one, you can go into uh, the description. If you need more information, you can go to our resources section and download our user guide from there, which has much more detailed information on each different measure. And you check what the me measure says. And if you implemented it, you can say yes. If you haven't implemented it, you can say no. Let's say we didn't implement this first two, maybe we did this one. So as you can see, if I were to say no to a B-rated one, my rating drops to uh, NR. And if I say yes to an A-rated one and a B-rated one, my rating is at A. So as you go through each of these measures, uh, you're able to um, see how your rating changes. And there's also flexibility in the system. So let's say you want to use a location that we have not fully integrated um, climate maps yet, but you still want to use the app, you can use the app. That's sort of why the not applicable here exists. Let's say you're in a location that's not prone to hurricanes uh, for a change. So then if, if there are measures here that are specifically for those, you can easily say this is not applicable. Or in the case of Dominican Republic, for example, a lot of places won't have chimneys and fireplaces. So they can say not applicable and uh, we don't have building, we don't build chimneys. And then submit that comment and you can waive that um, measure. So the flexibility is in there to be able to, for the app to be able to be usable globally practically. And in each category, you can look in different, to make different measures and evaluate where you're at and uh, move along it. One thing I wanted to highlight is the, the last, usually the last two measures, but we pick design. So it's the design review here is an important one. And for post-constructions, the construction audit gets added to each category. So those are very critical. And we see in many disaster cases, those are the make or break elements of ma in many cases that the reviews and audits, if they're done properly, the buildings are, um, are usually of um, higher performance. So you go through the project and once everything is completed, so you have to fill every, answer every single measure, the project will be uh, ready for verification. And then you can go to verification and invite your verifiers, which will then review the project and submit their notes uh, if they require you to change your answers, all that will also the application enables. For the for purpose of time, I'm not going into that detail for the moment, but maybe the only thing, uh, the last two things I wanna show is that you can invite different users, different members, to your project and they will be listed on this page. They could be editors, verifiers, or it could just be viewers. And the other element is that you can download your assessment and then share it with other stakeholders. Once the project is verified, you will see a tick mark here, which will indicate 
that project is verified. And let's say if you're now ready to move on to post-construction, you can add that as a new stage and it will be hosted under the same project, project page. And you can always access your projects from you know, my projects. You can bundle them in portfolios and um, uh, you, you can work through uh, with your stakeholders, with your teams collaboratively on the Building Resilience Index. So I'll stop there. That's great, Naz, and it, what a wonderful tool. And I have watched its uh, evolution. And every time I watch a demo, there's something wonderful new added. Um, we have a lot of great questions um, coming in. So let's spend a little bit of time. And you may want to, you can probably continue sharing your screen. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of good, really good questions on data. So let's confirm again. Um, is the data location specific? Is the list of hazards location specific? For which countries do we have, as you said, the deep dive? And how can we assess this um, if I'm not in the countries where everything is a deep dive? So let's just make sure that we clarify all of that and we go through um, that process. There's one more question on, on data um, as well, but let's do this one first. Okay, so the the second portion of that question is for which countries? So we have Philippines, Dominican Republic, and other Caribbean islands, and Vietnam uh, in the application uh, with with their hazard maps. And, and these are the full so, hazard maps, correct? Yes, exactly. But there are some hazard maps what we have globally, like volcano locations, landslides, and um, earthquakes, which is going to come very soon. So. Um, some are global, some are local, um, due to the nature of the hazards as, as well. Like some of them are also developed with like international um, teams at global scale, which is easier to obtain. And some are very localized, so you need to dig into uh, the relationship with local authorities to really um, get the best uh, maps. Great. And one of the questions was, you know, is the data on the app shared or all private? This is from Fatima. Fatima, we need to reach out to you. You're our best um, <laughs> follower today with lots of great questions. You know, can I take yes. advantage of someone else's data once an organization or project is created? So the, the hazard maps on the um, platform are not like they're for viewing only. And at the moment, so we are not allowing data downloads from our application due to um, also uh, intellectual property conditions from our data providers as well. That's one element, but otherwise you can view them publicly. Uh, when you create a project, uh, your project, you can make your project be mapped on the global map. For example, if, you, if I go back to the explore page, you'll see one of the verified projects in the uh, Philippines that show up here and we can go in and see the general information about this project, but not specific mitigation measures. But we know like what this project is, who's done it, what their ratings have been and what the risks that they are mitigating. But this is the, like. From what you've seen in a project page as a user versus what can be publicly viewed are uh, quite res restricted. And but this is it, an option, like you can choose to make it public so that you communicate it to global audiences. Great. And I think the idea is that in a few countries where we, we really did a deep dive, there's really no need for additional data. But if you are, let's say in Africa, where we, we have done some global maps, you can use other people's data to go in and say, well, this applies, this does not apply. And I think that was what you were showing in the demo. Um, if you select a project in one of the uh, countries where we have global maps, you can then say this is not applicable or choose to say this is applicable and, and include a little bit more information. So, for example, like the other day, uh, we were talking about how that works and we did the test hotel for Pakistan, right? So what we get is this disclaimer that you know, like we don't have the full mm. extent of the map. So please make sure that you you reach out to your local sources to make sure that you cross check. For each mitigation measure in the user guide, we indicate which hazards they're relevant to. So if those hazards are relevant for your location, you need to respond to them. If they're not, you can waive that measure. Great. Going mm. into very too much technical detail here, but yeah. 
Couple, uh, there's one question I think I can answer, which is, does IFC use the resilience index as part of our project financing process? Um, and the answer is yes. So IFC, as part of the World Bank group, has committed that all of our um, new projects are going to be what we call Paris Agreement aligned. That means that we are not going to finance a project um, that's going to harm climate change or be harmed by climate change. So we have to check, are we, are we launching a new project in an area that's going to be prone to, to risks? The idea is that through that process, we're then also helping the project you know, elevate their, um, their uh, response to risks. The other way that we're doing it is really helping the projects retrofit. So in our first webinar under the program what we call GRIP, um, and this is available for hotels and other buildings, the idea is that we're helping a hotel get on a net zero path, but also to retrofit for resilience. So there's sort of the, the two components um, are included in there and IFC can provide a package um, of financing that's going to help that property uh, retrofit and, and do both green side and the resilient side. Which then, uh, and then maybe you can help um, this question, Naz, which is how is Building resilience index aligned with edge, um, you know, can you have a green and resilience building by using overlapping data? You can talk about operational continu continuity and green uh, green part and others. So talk about the, the overlap of the 2. So, for for building resilience index, green building certification is actually 1 of the uh, operational continuity measures. So, we cover edge sort of within that along with other, uh, along with other certification uh, systems, of course. So uh, that a lot of green buildings due to their energy efficiency, renewable energy use and water efficiency are actually have those operational continuity measures inherently uh, because like in, in post disaster situations, we have we seen utilities get cut off or get damaged. And so if you have in house renewable energy or in house water, you know, uh, retention or to recycling, you actually are in a much resilient position to continue your operations. So we re really like the getting the, the, the linkage there uh, through the operation continuity. Absolutely. And we already mentioned on the water side, um, if, you know, if you identify that the, um, the building is in a water risk area from water supply, you can use edge to decrease your usage of water and again become uh, more resilient. So there is quite an overlap between all of these um, different tools, which is great. And one more thing to add, like a lot of the, the operational continuity hazards, such as heat waves, um, droughts, as we mentioned, those are sort of like passive design elements in green buildings, the energy efficiency elements, like good, you know, ventilation systems and all that actually help with those like heat related non physical assets damaging um hazards so uh, definitely there's there's certain things inherent to green buildings as well excellent now as we have a question it looks like you already have the page prepared which is talk about the uh the user guide so how do i as a hotel owner or consultant know what it is that i need to do to improve my practices so let's talk about uh even the way that we can create the user guide and how is it available to everyone so the user guide is, uh, we keep updating uh, as we go, is accessible on our resources page. You can download it from here. And it practically gives much more detailed information about each of the, what these hazards mean for the buildings. And each of the, we go through each of the mitigation measures, how they relate to different hazards. Some of them relate to multiple hazards because this is a multi-hazard risk uh, and resilience tool. So. Um, it really digs much deeper into every single thing that you you see in the application. In addition to the user guide, our frequently asked questions section is kind of walks you through the entire process of how you go about assessing a building. So if you if you don't see anything covered here, feel free to email at as uh, here from uh, building like uh, from from here at bri at ifc.org. So we'll we'll be happy to add more more content here. And yeah, this is great. I think um, what I always like about the way that IFC operates is that we really because we are such an international group. The idea is that these tools are, you know, of the people and for the people and from the people. 
right? So we are really um, using your power of, of crowdsourcing. We, we serve as a thought leader, but we don't pretend that we know everything. So there's always a back and forth um, with the users. Some, some other great questions, um, Naz. Um, are you, like an edge, able to review and tweak any of the assumptions? So let's talk about that in the, in the hazard maps. Um, you know, how much customization do you have? Um, and let's do it in both ways, in places like Dominican and in the Philippines, where we have the full hazard mapping versus in the rest of the world where we have some global hazard mapping. So can you and how tweak any of the assumptions? So, okay, I'm trying to, so in edge, it's, it's a little different, but um, here the customers, so the, 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 the tweaking I mentioned was that not applicable option mm -hmm. when you're answering, right? So that's sort of uh, how, um, a user can um, adjust if their location does not like have sort of a hazard that shows up in the application. Otherwise, we as the application developers have the ability to customize per country. If like certain specific countries require more like details or more performance. Um, Ex, uh, expectations for certain locations for different hazards, we are able to integrate them and customize them. But it, it's it's trying to find where it, it's less user adjustment at this point because we're talking about life safety and we want to make sure that all hazards are addressed. So that flexibility is a little more limited in building resilience index. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there was a question from Mary about human factors like uh, wars and other civil unrest. I would say those are not included, but again, it, the, it, the concept of operational continuity is there. If your building is fully self-sufficient with, with um, power, you know, with solar or other sources, then in a time of, of war, um, you won't have to rely on a grid that may be disrupted. And same thing if you if you have you know rainwater harvesting or other ways to deal with your water um, situation, then again you would have that. But we don't have obviously mapping for for civil unrest because it's not there. Um, let's talk about the you know is there professional certification for building resilience in this partitioners? So it goes back to that question of training and what the vision by IFC is to create an ecosystem of, of professionals working on this. Mm -hmm. So the online training course we're gonna um, uh, bring about will have certification to professionals. So it will have you know, training package in like exams in it. And then like multi-pass you get, um, you can get a certification. So there will be, um, and it will have layers, right? It will have like there. There will be a, pack, a course for general audiences. There'll be a course for all engineers and architects who want to do the assessment, and then there will be a course for um, those who are eligible to become verifiers. So there will be like people with significant experience in the field that could become verifiers that will be able to take that course. Excellent. So again, it's an entire ecosystem. Exactly. Um, we have one more question and then we'll wrap, wrap up. And this is again from, from Fatima. Um, does IFC sponsor projects that are certified from other organizations like LEED and BRIAM? And absolutely. So I will again encourage you watch our first webinar where we talked about the definition of, and this in this case was green buildings. For IFC, we asked that the building be uh, certified with international um, uh, uh, Finance or international green building certification standards; those that are pre-approved by the, um, uh, the the financial certifiers, and then the building does need to show impact. So the only irony really is with with some of the uh, tools like Lead or BRIAM, you have to do additional modeling to show that your building is twenty percent less. Whereas with something like Edge, all of that is included in one place. But the uh, the choice uh, to the project owner is anything as long as the project is is internationally certified let's go and kind of wrap up i'll go back to sharing my screen uh, naz to kind of give us the summary of the um of the building and resilience index and everything that you talked about and then we'll bring claire back for any last questions sure so 
Just to wrap up, just in summary, Building Resilience Index will help you identify risks for your building or hotel and for four main hazard categories and 15 hazards. It will provide you a list of risk reduction solutions to assess the current resilience status and or enhance your resilience. It will present you with a standardized rating level to easily communicate uh, your resilience with your stakeholders. And if from a hospitality perspective, building resilience index can help your design and construction teams to make more informed engineering decisions. It will help uh, minimize your post disaster losses and business disruption. It will enable you to communicate the resilience level and value of resilience to financial institutions, insurers, public sector, and your guests. And it will potentially facilitate your access to better insurance premiums. So we would like to encourage you all to sign up for Building Resilience Index and start assessing your hotels with it. Great. And Naz, you mentioned that the, the tool is free. And so who can we thank for making this public good available? Yeah, so our donors, Government of Netherlands, Australia, and the Rockefeller Foundation are uh, the are our supporters in developing this tool. But I would also like to thank our like technical experts from Arise Philippines, Build Change, FM Global, Resilience Action Fund, Miyamoto International, and GFDRR who help, and World Bank Group's ITS and innovation lab teams who have like really helped us put together this application and do continue to do so with their ex immense experiences and current experiences from all sorts of dis post-disaster situations around the world. Great. Claire, we can bring you back um, as well. And thank you to both Naz and Claire for a great presentation. I think we, we answered a lot of questions along the way. I hope this is a very interactive audience. It's always great. And when you do webinars, it's hard when you're speaking to a screen, but I, I felt interaction um, through here. And so we'll go through any of the, the last questions we're, uh, that we had the, uh, that are being posed in the chat and you know, we'll stay for a few more minutes. So please, um, uh, please pose additional uh, questions. Let's see, one of the questions is, is funding available for any African companies? Absolutely, um, IFC has um, global presence um, and we're working both through um, uh, through the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance and the level of brands. So we're bringing this awareness from the, from the brand level down, and then we're also working bottom up. So there are two ways that IFC can finance. One is through, uh, directly. Um, in that case, uh, if it's a new property, it's a little bit bigger, so we can you know, uh, just finance one property. For retrofits, we typically look for a cluster. So maybe uh, a local um, owner or operator that maybe has five or 10 properties um, under their purview. However, we also do work with financial institutions. Um, and so in the last webinar, we showed you there are a lot of banks um, around the world that are already incentivizing um, at, at least green buildings. And now that the building resilience index is going through, we're gonna work uh, to educate those same companies to start uh, you know, assessing risk, right? So if they're, if they're providing you finance and you are in a, in a climate risky area and you have not addressed those risks, well, you know, your, your uh, interest rate may go up or it may go down if you actually address them. So that's part of the education um, that we're doing this. Let's see, there's a question on, could we get the workflow process to access funding for companies supporting hospitality um, in business model? For IFC, um, we I can send out as part of our, our recap, there is a whole process for uh, proposals for finance. So there's certain information that we're looking into. And as I said, for us, um, for our direct finance, the projects do need to be of a certain size. So we're looking at maybe, you know, 50 to 100 million ticket for IFC to be involved because our due diligence is quite big. But we are also looking to uh, partner with local financial institutions and have that financial flow um, going on. And I'll send in our recap email the uh, the list of all of the banks that are that IFC is already working with that have that um, uh, process. Another question from Veronica: Do you provide finance for new sustainable hotels startup? Um, Claire, you can talk about you know your innovation. I'll I'll come from from IFC's point of view. We do have financing. Um, through a department we call disruptive technologies and funds. This is um, 
a little bit more, you know, startup, venture capital, um, uh, new kind of technologies. And a lot of what we're doing there is now on cooling. So we understood that, you know, we understand that sustainable cooling is going to be a, a significant need, um, particularly in, in South Asia. And so there are some new uh, ways that we're, that we're partnering with hotels and innovative cooling companies that are providing um, cooling as a service, for example. So I would say, it's more around service to existing hotels than maybe other hotel startup. But Claire, do you want to talk about any partnerships you have for inter entrepreneurship and startups in the hotels, the sustainable hotel space? Um, yeah, I mean, I think from our point of view, really, we um, we we welcome people to become members of of the alliance, um, and we work with lots of hotel companies, as I mentioned, that kind of share different um, different best practices. We've got lots of different partners um, from around the industry that support both in terms of being suppliers to the industry, um, but also consultancies that kind of. Um, can help provide information about how to make hotels more sustainable um, and various expert partners as well. So I think from from our side, it's less on, I guess, the actual sort of finance um, piece, but more about yeah the, the partnerships that we can um, we can offer and people that we can put um, companies in touch with if they're interested in finding out about particular um, particular issues and then we also um, as part of what we do run lots of um, projects on the ground projects pilot that pilot different um, and kind of new innovations um, where I think I mentioned earlier our, our new five-year strategy that we released earlier this week part of that is going to be really looking at how we can find regenerative solutions new solutions to um, to the issues that we're facing. So we'll have a lot more coming out on that um, in, the, in the coming years. Great. Um, and I think one of our other partners to both institution is the UNWTO, uh, the, the UN uh, uh, Tourism Organization, and they have a lot of programs around entrepreneurship. So that's another mm -hmm. resource. You know, there really is a global coalition of players that is working on, um, on these same issues. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, Naz, I guess question to you, um, uh, making a project located in seismic region of Italy and how this could be used. Um, and then do you have a checklist or a KPI model to use the first time we were addressing um, hotels that have not dealt with building resilience? Who to talk to on this case? Oh, for our um, listener from Italy, I actually would want to mention that uh, there is a incredible global resource called global earthquake model which we have partnered with and we'll be like integrating to our application within a month or so so our earthquake uh, hazard maps will be incredibly um, strong uh, on that um, I'm very very com com confident in that because it's it's a global um, science, all global scientists putting all their resources uh, to developing this. And so, uh, and uh, yeah, so we're very, very happy to have be able to collaborate with them to integrate their work. So make sure you wait for that a little bit, I would say. Um, for the KPI, well, so I think with hospitality sector, it's, it's the, the operational staff plus the engineering staff that will be critical. Uh, in this like resilience assessment and the integration of resilience solutions. So um, it goes a little beyond the, our usual sustainability suspects is what I would say. And um, really um, like th those that are like looking at the, the structural elements as well as engineering elements of the buildings would be our key, key partners while we uh, think through these solutions. Um, but of course, the higher in the management it gets acknowledged, uh, the, the better it is for the organization to adopt in as in any case. So, um, and I mean, if it's, if a hotel, hotel is in a region that's already experiencing a lot of events, I think it will be like a no brainer for the hotel management to acknowledge the need for this. Great. I will, um, I'll end by basically saying, you know, you can 
uh, read a document like the pathway to net positive hospitality. That's really going to give you an overview and a strategy. So whether you're a consultant, someone embedded in a hotel, an owner, a financier, you will really get an overview of, of different steps. And then the tools such as edge building resilience, our financing tools are the ways to meet those particular strategies. So I think that's a, a 1 way um, to do it. I will um, end us here. We're just right at time. A reminder to everybody, the slides will be posted as soon as our um, system uh, generates the, the link. We're going to post it on our um, landing page, and then we'll send an email to everybody with follow ups and anything else that has um, that has happened today. You have been a great audience, very, very interactive. We really appreciate it. And again, met many, many thanks to um, to Naz and Claire, and as well as to the you know the staff that's behind this. Is you know quite a lot of people that build all these things so they look great to you, but are great technical tools uh, behind. So I'll stop recording and end our webinar. And thank you so much for participating. Thanks, Mir, for organizing.